I started fencing in Oregon when I was 10 years old. I hooked up with Ed Perfonti at um, what used to be, our, our club used to have a different name, but it is still uh, the same place as now, Oregon Fencing Alliance in Portland. Um, and if those of you who don't know Ed Perfonti, you probably should, and hopefully get to talk to him a little bit this evening too. As Sloan said, oh, the best coach, so favorite coach in the world, in my opinion. Um, and so, Luckily, this weekend, you guys are going to get to work with him and meet him a little bit. So, um, so I, I started fencing when I was 10 just because my older brother wanted to sword fight. My mom found the club, brought him into a couple classes, and I decided it looked like fun after a while and got a little bit of jealous of him looking like he was having so much fun in the classes. So I decided to sign up for um, fencing lessons as well. And even though a lot of my success came in Sabre, I fenced foil for the first four or five years. Um, and that was also, I was getting lessons from Ed, and he also coached uh, Seth Kelsey, who's an Olympian, in Epe, so he's very versatile. So he taught me um, a lot of the basics in foil, um, and I spent, like I said, for four or five years, and eventually a lot of the people in my club started switching over to Sabre, and I had nobody left to practice against, so I was like, well, I might as well just like try Sabre so I can continue to do the sport that I love, and um, I tried it one day, it gave me a Sabre lesson, and I don't know if it's because Saber is his original weapon, or it was just something completely new and different to me. Um, I loved it immediately and decided to forget foil and move on with Saber, and so that's when things kind of started to take off for me. Um, and uh, a bit of my, I guess, genetic history, uh, some of you may or may not know that my parents are both Olympic rowers, and they were on the U.S. Um, team in 1976, so I always had kind of a feeling for the Olympics and how they were kind of a special thing to be a part of, and, and it was something that um, was really unique and, and really, um, you know, prestigious thing to be a part of. And so ever since I was little, and when I finally found sport fencing and knew that this was my passion, this was a sport I really wanted to be involved in, um, I knew, always knew that I, eventually I wanted to make the Olympic team. And that's like a lot to put on a plate of a 10-year-old girl, but um, I always knew that it was something that I, wanted to do, I wanted to be, and, um, and you know, it helped that I had really good role models with my parents, but also within our club, you know, Ed's a very accomplished um, fencer in his his day back in Poland, and also Adam Skarbankiewicz is, was at our club, and he at the time was an active um, member of the national team and doing really well and everything, so I had a lot of really good uh, role models and examples to kind of look up to when I was younger and kind of help fuel that Olympic dream ever since I was 10, so... Um, you know, I just kind of had fun with fencing, and eventually, um, when, when I got to high school, I started buckling down, getting really serious, traveling to World Cups, and um, just kind of getting a lot of experience under my belt ever since I was like 13 or 14. I made my first cadet world team in the eighth grade, so I think I was like 14 years old, and then ever since then, I was on cadet junior and senior teams and, and um, had a lot of cool experiences with my teammates and stuff. Uh, but the big eye on the prize that I had the whole time was making the Olympic team. Um, and for those of you, I mean, I don't know how deep your history goes with fencing, but um, women's saber wasn't even inducted into the Olympics until Athens in 2004. And luckily for me, that was really good timing because I was just the right age and had just the right amount of experience when it came time to really focus on the fact that to like actually make the team for real. It, it started out as a dream when I was 10, 11, 12, and kind of growing through my Olympic career. And then um, by the time we learned that uh, Women's Saber was actually gonna have their place in the Olympics, that's when Ed and I kind of were like, kind of, I don't know if we actually had a conversation about it, but it was just like, okay, now it's business time. This is really like, we're gonna have to up our training. We're gonna have to get better and improve on things every day. So. Luckily for me, I had a coach who really understood that and understood we were on the same page when it came to like my dreams and goals and aspirations, and he was willing to work with me for hours and hours and hours, as long as it took as much time in the gym as needed for me to achieve those goals. So I was really lucky to have him also be another one of those driving forces and good examples behind um, my dream that I wanted to uh, have come true someday. So like I said, with the timing, it all worked out. I graduated high school in 2003, and the Olympics were going to be about a year and three months later, approximately. So uh, I had applied to the University of Notre Dame, got in, but deferred my admission 
so I could stay at home with Ed and train at Oregon Fencing Line. Um, and again, it all comes down to having people around you that are really going to support that goal. Ed was completely dedicated to helping me make the team, helping me improve as a fencer. Like I said, Adam was there and he became my personal trainer and kicked my butt every single day. And um, I started to become a better athlete and a better fencer than I ever thought that I could at that point. And, and so slowly as Athens started to approach and the cutoff of the team started to approach, I felt really great about my confidence level, about my results that I was having. Um, unfortunately, qualification in 2004 was really tough because Women's Sabre had the individual, but they didn't have the team, and I'm sure as a lot of you are aware. So you had to qualify by your individual world ranking. And at that point, I had never won a World Cup. I had been on the senior team, but I think my best result at that point was probably like seventh at World Championships or something like that. And then other than that, I maybe made a few finals here and there in World Cup. So it was a little bit daunting, I guess, to look at the big picture and say, okay, I have to be in the top 10 in the world, in the world. And I've never done that before in order to make this dream come true, which is really hard, but luckily, you know, Ed just worked with me, Adam worked with me, they both really pushed me to just be positive and think positive and, and just keep working harder than, you know, I thought that I could. They, they would push me further than I thought I could push myself on my own. So I was really lucky to have that really good support system. And at the same time, my parents were really understanding of what I was going through because when they were trying to make the Olympic team in rowing, they knew what kind of sacrifices that had to be made, not only by their, them being parents, but me being the athlete that's trying to make the team. So they were able to give me really good guidance and advice. Um, and it really taught me to trust the people that were around me and trust, listen to Adam when he made me like run 10 more lines. I'm like, I don't want to do this, but then he would remind me, this is what we're doing this for. We're doing it so you can make the team. We're doing it so you can win that gold medal. When I didn't feel like getting up for a lesson at 9 o'clock in the morning. You know, Ed would be like, well, this is what we're working for. And it was always, you know, I am the prize. It's always, this is what we're working for. And, um, you know, it, it does take a certain amount of personal motivation, but I know that if it wasn't for that support system around me, working towards trying to make that dream come true, then it probably never would have happened. And then it almost didn't happen because with the qualification, um, when it came down to the cutoff, it came, unfortunately for us, it was not clear who was going to make the team until the very last tournament in March that was held in Italy. And even more unfortunately, it was coming down to a competition between me and my American teammate and, and one of my very good friends, Emily Jacobson. And um, even more unfortunately, I had to fence Emily's sister to determine who was going to make the team, me or Emily. So if you can imagine any of a high, higher pressure situation than that, let me know because I've never experienced anything. <laughs> or, I don't know, it was the, probably the most nerve wracking experience of my life to compete in that competition in Italy. And when it came down to it, I ended up losing to Seda 15-14. Um, and I didn't make the team by one point on the international rankings. And if you can imagine being a 10 year old girl and just wanting this my entire life, and I'm 19 years old, I took time off of school, I you know, dropped everything, I focused on this, I had Ed pulling for me, I had Adam, you know, just everybody like believed in me, I believed in myself, and I was ready to just like go to Athens and make the team, and it wasn't an easy journey, and then to come all that way and put all that work in, and then all of a sudden not make it in a split second, and lose 15-14, was probably the worst feeling ever because you see all this work that you put in and, and you expect everything, you know, they say hard work pays off, they say, you know, I dedicated my life to this and then it didn't happen the way it was supposed to happen. You know, you picture something and then you picture the way that something's supposed to come out and then it doesn't happen like that. And then you don't really know what to do with yourself. Um, 